I invite you then to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. When you have an opportunity to preach a message and there's not really a chance for follow-up, which is my case because we'll be gone out of town for a little bit, I, for myself anyway, I really think through this. Perhaps I overthink what I should present. There's so much in the Word of God. But it's hard to escape as we look around us, consider the news that's all of this, all, always coming to us. It's hard to escape the idea that we are in a time period that is rapidly approaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. We know that occurs in two stages, the rapture of the church, followed by the tribulation period, and then the second coming proper when Christ comes in judgment. For us, there should be an encouragement as we look at the word then and find these troubling events around us given context. It can help to ease our minds. And more than that, it can help us to reach out to other individuals who are in need of truth. I don't know if you have the opportunity, if people come to you and ask you your opinion about things that are going on. It's encouraging to have something from the Word of God to share with them. Even though the words from the Word of God aren't necessarily encouraging of themselves, and we'll find some of those kinds of things here in this passage. Second Peter chapter 3 asks us the question, what sort of people ought we to be? In light of the truths that we're going to look at. In our world, people live their lives for a lot of different goals. And really, the way in which you live says a lot about what you're living for. I was talking with someone very recently, gave him an invitation, a gospel tract, an invitation to come to church, and he said, oh, I don't really have time for that. And then he stopped before I could interject anything. He said, well, I know, I ought to make time for it, and I don't. At least he understood the problem. But there are a lot of individuals who live for a job, who live for a house, who live for vacations, who live for an IRA, who live, for, I don't know, for a lot of different things. It was Malcolm Forbes, the billionaire, who said, he who dies with the most toys wins. Isn't that a sad perspective on life and death? If that's what life is about... Oh, yeah, he had lots of cars, he had planes, he had boats, he had all sorts of things. But at the end of it, you come to the finality of death. And as the wise man in Ecclesiastes said, then whose shall all these things be? What good is, are, are things when death is surely coming? So we come to Second Peter chapter 3. Let's... Look, just jump right into verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, in light of the fact that there are a lot of prophecies, and that's what verse 2 says in God's holy word, and we're going to look at what some of those consist of. But knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from before the beginning of creation. What we're going to find as we continue to read, and I want to pause and read it little by little, the truth we're going to come to is the fact that this world and everything in it is going to be dissolved, destroyed. There is coming an end to all of it. And that is despite the fact that scoffers continue scoffing. Now, these scoffers that are mentioned here are many times considered experts by our world. They're individuals who have it all figured out, so, so to speak. They may be scholars. They may be individuals with multiple postgraduate studies and degrees behind their name. But God calls these scholars scoffers. The word scoffer is a mocker. 
And there's sort of a play on words that's going on here in verse 3 because the scoffers will be scoffing, the mockers will be mocking. It's what you would expect of them, but it's worded in such a way that helps you to see that God's well aware of what's going on with these individuals. But if you notice in verse 3, they're not only scoffing, but they're following their own sinful desires. They're self-indulgent. The fact of the matter is, as Scripture presents it, corrupt morals and corrupt teaching or corrupt ideas of truth have the same source. And that's why we're warned about individuals who preach wrong doctrine. And one of the things that you will inevitably find in the life of someone who preaches wrong doctrine is corrupt morals. And vice versa. You will not find the individual who has corrupt morals but has correct doctrine. It just doesn't work because it comes from the same source. It either comes from God in the sense of truth or it comes from Satan in many different brands under many different labels, but it's all error. And these scoffers are scoffing concerning the predictions of Scripture, if you look at verse 2, as well as what follows. The Bible prophecies, when we try to present what God's Word says is going to happen, individuals inevitably who are unbelievers will begin to scoff. And some of these will base their arguments on an appeal to, quote-unquote, history. The history that is mentioned here is that everything's continuing basically the same. You talk about it getting worse, but really we're just becoming more enlightened and, and developed and so on and so forth, and they have their story In fact, if you look at the doctrine or teaching concerning origins, where did life come from? This is one of the areas where you see that they just want to say, well, everything's just basically continued the same. It's a doctrine called uniformitarianism. And based on that, everything has always occurred at roughly the rate that it's occurring today. That's why they believe the Grand Canyon was formed by the Colorado River. And if you look at water volume, it makes no sense. But they say, you know, this little stream just found really soft spots in the earth. And over time, well, it takes a long time. And scientists have learned that if facts don't work, add more time. Because you weren't there a million years ago, you can't say what could have happened. Well, there was someone who was there, but not a million years ago, because that kind of time never existed. But there's also another element that's introduced here, and that's the element of willful ignorance of God's Word. Look at verses 5 through 7 with me, if you will. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, they deliberately, these scoffers, deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Now, notice these things. They deliberately overlook. That means it's there, it's in front of their face, and they choose not to see it. That the heavens and the earth were made by the word of God. Creation. These are things which are denied by the scoffers. goes on to say, and that by means of these, this water... The world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. That there was a worldwide flood. And that that explains many of the geological formations we see in our world. But by the same word, the same word which created all things, by that same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. What the verses are saying is that God's in control of it all, that God is letting sin run its course for right now, but that judgment is certain. And that the same word that produced the creation, let there be light, and so on through the creation account, will also produce the end of all things in final judgment. So again, the willful ignorance of these individuals is seen. 
they should know that everything was formed by the word of God, that God spoke and it came into existence. But man has his own idea, right? What does man say? Well, man says in the beginning, nothing exploded and that nothing began the evolution of everything. So nothing produces everything. Scripture, on the other hand, says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you're left with a choice. Which one are you going to believe? Man who was not there or God who was? It's really not a difficult choice. And when time has been obliterated and now we're down to just eternity, in that eternal day, Revelation 4.11 says, we will praise the Lord like this, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things by and by your will, they existed and were created. Do you look forward to joining in that chorus of praise? Won't that be an amazing thing? To praise God for what he has done. But there is not only in these verses what God has done, but what God will do. Judgment has come and will come to earth. As we look through Scripture, and we're really answering one of life's big questions. The first thing is, the first question is, where did everything come from? And God's Word says, in the beginning, God created. But then we come to the question, if God created, why are things so messed up? Why is there such misery, disease, death? Well, we find that Scripture describes that scenario as well in Genesis chapter 3, we're informed of the first sin of Adam and Eve and the judgment that followed as God pronounced a curse on the earth and on the efforts of man. And then it's a little while later and God sends this worldwide flood that we referenced in the reading in verse 6, Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, detail the occurrence of that flood and what God did and why God sent that flood upon the earth. And then when we get to the New Testament, we find that actually God's judgment isn't just something that happens once in a while. God's judgment is continual. It is ongoing. We are seeing it in our nation has anyone asked you the question, why are there so many mass shootings these days? Number one, you can get on the news. Seems to be some people's motivation. But it's also a part of the curse. It is God's judgment raining down on our country. Now, am I saying that children who are killed in a school massacre were judged particularly by God? No. What I'm saying is that sin produces terrible consequences which are visited on people that are horrendously guilty and others that don't seem so guilty. But it's all a part of the curse. It's all a part of sin and God's ongoing judgment. It's not easy to watch. But when you live in a country that declares good, evil, and evil good, you can't expect anything but chaos. That's where we are. Verse 7 described a future judgment that is yet to come on this earth that will be by fire and will be so great that it will, be, it will destroy the entire earth and everything in it. That judgment will come. Just as certainly as the other judgments God has promised have always shown up. Then we get to verses 8 and 9. Notice verse 8, first of all, it says, But do not overlook this one fact. Remember, there's that overlooked information about creation, about God's judgment in the flood and His coming judgment. Don't overlook this one fact. Beloved, that, the, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. This is one of those verses in Scripture that is so horrendously ripped out of context and applied and misapplied in so many different ways that it's, it would be laughable if it weren't so serious. You would think that people would have a little bit more perception. But let's try to look at this a little bit more. We'll get to verse 9 in just a moment. We need to understand that God's mercy holds back that judgment that we were just talking about. 
that every time God sends judgment on earth, there is always an element of mercy. For Adam and Eve, there was a sacrifice and a coming redeemer. For Noah, there was the ark. For us today, what is the rescue? It is Jesus Christ and his salvation. And this message continues to come to individuals that anytime judgment falls, there is always an opportunity to turn to God unless you wait a little too long. For instance, the Battle of Armageddon. Now, this verse, verse 8, has led many people to say that God doesn't know anything about time. But I want us to remember something very interesting, very basic. God invented time, and so he understands it very well. Making, let's make this statement very obvious. Time exists within the existence of God. God does not exist within time. Time is a, a parenthesis in the existence of God, a, de, a decimal point. For us, time controls everything that we are. And as we age, what one of us doesn't think, my goodness, I would like to be that age again. Always a younger one. When you're just starting out life, you're always thinking, I want to be older, I want to be older. But you get, you, you get cured of that pretty quick. But God invented time. Let's, what do I mean by that? When we get to the creation account, many individuals are tempted to say, well, you know, that day doesn't really mean day, but I want to just submit to you that it does mean six literal 24-hour days. God knows how to tell time. What is the evidence internally in Genesis chapter 1? Well, every day is bounded by evening and morning. There's also an ordinal number there. In other words, first, second, third. And God is making it very clear. This is day one. This is day two. This is day three. And so on and so forth. The days of creation are not long ages. Of course, if you tried to make the creation of the world fit into long ages, if you're going to say that God's word is at least accurate in the order in which things were created, how many million years were there between the creation of plants and the appearance of the sun? It's a little bit of a problem. But the fact of the matter is, God knows how to tell time. It's very obvious in Scripture when time means what it ordinarily means. There's another reference in Scripture that people twist all out of shape. It's called the millennium. The millennium, surprisingly enough, will really be a thousand years long. How do I know that? Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7, six times says 1,000 years. So I have a question for those who say, eh, it's not really a thousand years, it's just referring to a period of time. If God had meant to say a thousand years, really, literal, one thousand years, what would he have had to say to convince you? I would think the repetition of one thousand years, six times in seven verses, should be sufficient. And yet we invent things. Because people that want to deny the millennium, they're amillennialists. And I know some pretty good preachers on every other point than this one. Well, they have a couple other points. They have a lot of good things to say on a lot of subjects. But when they come to this one, they cannot see the forest for the trees. And they get hung up on this as if this verse, 1,000 years is as a day and a day is as 1,000 years, means that God doesn't know how to tell you anything about time because he's confused or something. That makes no sense. But to be fair, there are some time references that don't refer specifically and literally to the first thought that may come to mind. For instance, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a period of judgment, not a day per se. There are many days involved in this day of the Lord. How do we know that's the truth and how does that make sense? Well, roughly 25 times the phrase day of the Lord is mentioned in Scripture and there are a variety of descriptions that go along with that phrase day of the Lord. We're talking about everything from the tribulation, or I should say from the uh, rapture of the church and the tribulation all the way up through the battle of Armageddon, through the millennial kingdom, and to the final conflict. That's all the day of the Lord until you get to the final judgments, the great white throne judgment, and then the eternal state is ushered in. 
But the day of the Lord refers to a day of a time of extended judgment when God is righting wrongs. Now that shouldn't be too surprising to us because we're used to that kind of speech. You ever heard of someone say, back in my day? As long as they're not 10, that makes some sense. But another one we talk about in this day, I really hate the phrase in this day and age, one of my pet peeves. I hope I never say it because it bothers me so much. It would interrupt my flow of thought. The point, though, is that these are devices, literary devices that, are, that we understand don't really refer to a day as so much as a time period. But in Scripture, it's going to be very obvious what God means by what he says. But what's then the meaning of this verse, verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 3, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. What it means is that God is not bound by time. He's not a mortal creature. He is immortal. What does immortal mean? Immortal doesn't just mean it'll never die. It means that he doesn't even age. Though Scripture describes God as the ancient of days, it's just referring to the fact that for every day of human existence, past, present, and future, God exists. And if he were a human, he would be old. But since he is God, age means nothing. And so for God to make a promise and keep it 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, even 4,000 years later, and when, really when you get to Genesis 3.15, the Protoevangelium, the promise of the Redeemer, just after the fall when God has come and establish the judgment and so forth, from that time frame to the fulfilling of Jesus Christ coming to earth to absolutely destroy Satan, to crush the serpent's head, 4,000 years had elapsed. But God hadn't forgotten the promise. If you and I make a promise, it's time relative, isn't it? It's very much time relative because we have a lifespan and I don't even know how long my lifespan will be, nor do you. And the fact is, if I make a promise, I better have the intention of keeping it rather quickly because time and chance happen to us all. God isn't bound by time. He doesn't have to confine his plans to his lifetime because that is unlimited Another thing we can take from this one year and a thousand years, one day and a thousand years, is God not only is not bound by time, he is not delayed in fulfilling his word. Nothing has ever delayed God. Because delay presupposes surprise. God has never been surprised by anything. He always knows what's going to happen before it happens. So when he plans to fulfill his word, it is not that he plans and then has to replan or go to plan B. That never happens. God always fulfills his word in his time. And it doesn't matter if it takes thousands of years. It's always been a part of his plan if that's the case. But as in this case and ever, every other that we can find in Scripture other than the final moment, when it's finally too late, his mercy offers salvation to any who will believe. While judgment is falling, in the days of the tribulation, a multitude of people that cannot be numbered will be saved from every kindred and tongue and people and nation. What do you think that means? It could well mean that there will be more people in heaven saved during the tribulation, just those seven years, than throughout all of human history to that point. I don't know. It's going to be a phenomenal number. That is certain. But then, 
we skipped, I think, verse 9. Let me look at verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come or should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed." God makes it very clear that judgment will take the unbeliever by surprise. Isn't it amazing that that's true? The unbeliever will be caught by surprise. I say it's amazing because it's been predicted for thousands of years. It's right there in Scripture, but what happens? Because time continues, the scoffers scoff and... Oh, it's never going to change. Things have always, they get worse and they'll get better and it's just cyclical. But the fact of the matter is that there are some elements of God's prophecy that make it a little bit more difficult to pin down some of the details. For instance, the timing is unpredictable by mankind. God knows exactly when all these things are going to happen. But that's what's being stated here in verses 9 and 10. The timing is going to be as that of the thief in the night. The thief does not intent, announce his intent. He just shows up and he steals what he wants to steal. Have you had that happen to you? I have. Fortunately, they broke into a building where some of my tools were, which was not my house and not even near my house. And they broke into a vehicle which was right in front of my house and I didn't notice it because I was sleeping. But the fact of the matter is, the thief came in the night, made off with what they wanted to make off with. Now, one thing we need to be careful of here in verse 10, when it says the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, it's not saying that Jesus Christ will be a thief in any sense. Do we understand that? We're not attributing bad motives to the Son of God. It is the day that comes. It is the event that is this thief in the night. Because that thief, again, does not announce his intent to arrive. He doesn't tell you. He doesn't send you a letter, an email, text message. He just shows up. And in this context, even when Christ was here on earth, he said that he did not know the day or the hour. But that was in the hands of the Father. Only God knows the day or the hour of any of these events, such as the rapture, the second coming, and so forth. There are signs for some of them that give people idea, give us ideas, but many people have made predictions. Anytime you find someone making a prediction of a year, a month, a day, anything like that, anytime they're trying to get specific as to when Christ is coming back, count on it. God's already planned to frustrate that plan. God doesn't work on anybody's calendar but his own. It's unpredictable in its timing, though God knows that timing exactly. But another reason it's so surprising for people is because of this event's unprecedented severity. When Scripture talks about destruction, greater than mankind has ever known, we can look back to some of those really bad times and say, you mean it's going to be worse than? And the answer is yes. If you look at all of the destruction that God's word promises for the days of the tribulation period, trust me, it's a time you do not want to experience. I feel so badly for those individuals who are post-trib. They believe Christ is going to come back after the tribulation or pre-wrath, or mid-trib, or all these other things, they really want to go through that stuff? I don't believe Scripture says that we will. But the point of it is that there is a time of unprecedented severity and judgment. God will never have judged the earth quite like he will. Scripture says that the heavens will pass away with a great roar. What that will sound like. It says the heavenly bodies, celestial bodies, planets, stars, so on and so forth, will be burned up and dissolved, even the moon. You imagine the effect of these things. It says here that the earth and all of its works will be exposed, they will be destroyed. 
And in fact, nothing will escape the judgment of God. That's severe judgment. But that judgment will also take many people by surprise because of their appalling ignorance of scriptural truth. Again, as we looked earlier, people choose to be ignorant. They choose not to know the truth that God's word puts in front of us. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 2 to 4 say this, For you yourselves are fully aware, why? From scripture. That the day of the Lord, this time of judgment, will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Believers won't be surprised nearly as much as the unbelievers. Though there will be a a point of unpredictability to these events, the fact is we see them delineated in Scripture. And it's often been observed that the time when we are most clear about prophecy is after it's fulfilled. I wonder how many people will be looking at Scripture as the different judgments are falling during the tribulation saying, there it is. It's what it said. Still wondering what the star called Wormwood, what that's going to look like. It's going to be very impactful in many ways. But the fact is that people are going to be surprised because they're not reading what Scripture says. Verse 11, since all these things are to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? There's our question. What kind of people should we be? What impact should this truth have upon our lives? That judgment, the the knowledge that we have of that coming judgment should change the way we live our lives. The first thing that's mentioned in verse 11 is this aspiration toward holiness and godliness. Let's discuss those terms, holiness and godliness. Sometimes I think we think we understand them and maybe we don't understand them as well as we should. We should aspire to holiness and godliness. We're talking about holiness. The first thing that comes to our mind is that we need to live a life separate from sin. And while that's true, that's not the entirety of what we're looking at or what Scripture is presenting. The holiness of God is his complete distinctness from everything else, from everything creaturely, we could say, everything created. God is holy apart. That's a W-H there at that, on that word holy. His holiness means that he is distinct from everything else. Sinlessness is one of those distinctions. His mercy, his grace, his love, there are more distinctions. For us then as believers, holiness demands of us that we live a life distinct from the life that the world lives. And I think a very good description, we're not going to divert to read it, of this kind of distinctness comes in 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17, where we're told not to love the world. And the world is described in terms of its wrong desires. Desire for prestige, personal advancement, and so on and so forth. God says these things are worldly. So a believer needs to live for something other than wealth, prestige, toys, and all of these other pursuits. When we talk about godliness, the most basic idea we can derive from it is that we need to live a life that's totally devoted to God. But that devotion to God means imitation of God's character. Isn't it impressive that God has given to us not only a description of his infinite character to the point that we can understand it, but he calls us to be like him. Now that is an astounding assignment. If you've ever had an unreasonable teacher who required of you that which you thought you could not give, only to discover partway through the semester that somehow you could give it. 
this is one of those things that will be a lifetime trying to achieve it and never really arriving. And yet we will be the better for having made the effort. It is a poor Christian who is content with him or herself and the progress they have made spiritually. Verse 12 then says, Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Verse 12 says we should look forward to God's coming judgment. Doesn't that sound a little troubling? That we should look forward to God's coming judgment? But isn't that clearly what the verse says? It says we're supposed to be waiting for. Now that word waiting for doesn't just mean knowing it will come and wonder when it will be, but rather the word implies waiting expectantly for this coming judgment. Why should we wait expectantly for something absolutely horrendous? Because it represents something so much better. It represents the end of temptation and sin. Because when God's judgment is completed upon this earth, we will be like his son Jesus Christ, our Savior. Having seen him as he is, there will be given to each of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior a glorified body, that is absolutely redeemed in every aspect that wants only to praise and to honor God and is only capable of that. That means we will not desire nor be capable of sinning. Wouldn't that be a refreshing change? You see, we sin without even thinking about it. And the more progress we think we make towards sanctification, the more aware we should be of the sin that is within us. That is the, the spirit of Romans chapter 7, when this spiritual giant, the apostle Paul, says, woe is me, who will deliver me from the body of this death? He knew himself to be sinful. But this time of judgment also represents Satan's full and final defeat. At the end of the millennial kingdom described there in Revelation chapter 20, when Satan is loosed for a short season and he recruits this army of malcontents from all over the world who have just lived through 1,000 years of the perfect reign of Jesus Christ. And what happens? Satan and his cohorts are defeated by a simple word from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. Satan is in the lake of fire, never to be released again. Never to bother a single person. Satan's full defeat is a cause for expectation. It also represents the beginning of Christ's eternal kingdom, the eternal state that's ushered in this wonderful time of being in the presence of God, serving him day and night. Well, there will be no night there. In an endless day, no need of rest, no sickness, no death, forever in the presence of our Lord. But then there's another word here that's a little bit troubling considering the context. Not only are we waiting expectantly for this coming judgment, we're also hastening. We're speeding it along. How do we speed up the coming of the Lord? Well, in one sense, we can't. We can't change the date that God has set in mind for these things to occur. But the idea is that we are kind of giving a glimpse to everyone around us of what that's going to be like when the rights have finally been championed and the wrong has been cast aside. We do that through godly living, through living like the God we're supposed to be imitating. We do it through evangelistic fervor as we seek to reach those that Christ came to die for. And we advance the kingdom of Christ through prayer. There is a quotation in the disciples' prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, 
your kingdom come. May your kingdom come. That's expressing this anticipation. And this praying, in a sense, is hastening, is speeding along the coming of that kingdom. And then verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Again, we're not just simply looking forward morbidly to this time of great destruction, but rather we're eagerly anticipating the new heavens and the new earth that will replace the old. I'm told that every time NASA or anyone else tries to send a rocket up into outer space, they have to first of all calculate where all the space junk is. Got to miss that. So all that will be taken care of. You see, every place that humankind goes, we tend to leave litter. God's going to take care of all of that, and beyond that, it's the corruption that has been brought on by sin. As verse 13 says, and it really goes all the way back to verse 2, this is in response to the promises that God has made. You know that when God makes a promise, when there's a prophecy in Scripture, it's not a suggestion of what might happen. It's absolutely rock-solid truth that's published ahead of the date. God knows what will happen. And so his promises tell us about this coming day, this new heaven and new earth. If you want to look at some passages on your own time, look at the last two chapters of the book of Isaiah, both judgment and the new heaven and new earth, and Revelation 21 and 22, which describe very succinctly, but in some detail, what it will be like in this newly recreated heavens and earth. The end of verse 13 said this new heavens and new earth are, is a place then where righteousness dwells. This is a fitting home for the righteous soul. God makes it so. This idea of where righteousness dwells is the idea that this is where righteousness lives, where it resides, where it calls its permanent home. This is the place of righteousness. Look at a couple of verses that give an inkling of this. The first is found in Isaiah 32, verse 17. The effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. Again, that only happens in a new heaven and new earth because where you have sinful man, none of this works. Or Isaiah 45 and verse 8 says, Let the skies rain down righteousness. What a thought. Amos chapter 5 verse 24 says, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In other words, it never stops. Righteousness is all there is. And in preparation for that, we come to verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, for all of these things, these promises to be fulfilled, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Application, we should diligently avoid anything that will contaminate us as believers. Not only the things that we're aware of that can contaminate us, but the things that God reveals in his word. We're, said to be, we're told to attempt to be without spot, that is, without the stain of sin. Without blemish could also be translated blameless. And then it says, at peace, without divisions and strife. And there you think of the Corinthian church. And the antithesis that they presented to this goal of the true believer. The question is, how do each one of us want Christ to find us? Do we want to be this blameless one? Unspotted from the world at peace. Well, we've got to strive for that. 
We've got to work that out in our lives. And as we work on these things, what happens is this righteousness that verse 13 talked about begins to be revealed in us. Or as 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 remind us, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he, Christ, appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everything's going to be dissolved. Everything we see about us, destroyed. Our responsibility is to focus on our relationship to Jesus Christ and bringing others to him. We have an opportunity to be the kind of people God wants us to be, to answer that question, how, what kind of persons ought we to be in light of this destruction that's coming, in light of the glory that will be ours. We ought to live up to that righteousness that God has implanted in us through Jesus Christ. I hope these words will encourage us in days that can be discouraging, disheartening, and even fearful. Ray, would you come and lead us in that last song and then we'll close in a word of prayer.